everybody joining right now. We'll get started shortly. Great, great. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. My name is John Fagan. And I'll be hosting you today along with my colleagues here, Evan Parry. Uh, Sal, well, he's a scribe expert and Hannah Driver, who's a senior yeah. accountant. Um, so I'm just gonna, we're just gonna test the chat. So uh, just do a shout out on the chat when the uh, COVID is fully over, pandemic is a lot more safer. Well, it'd never be fully over. What country would you love to go on holiday? What's your favorite country? If you want to drop that into the chat right now and we'll get an idea of all the kind of great places you'd love to go on holiday when you fully feel safe. Maybe it'll be UK. Maybe uh, it'll be good to see your results there. If the chat is annoying you um, during the event, because we get a lot of people complaining about that, if it pops up, just close it down and don't click on it when it pops up a little bit of message here. If you click it on there, it'll pop up again, a big window. Just close it down and ignore it if it is chatting you. Some people say it gets in the way of the presentation. So, oh, we've got some good, oh, Mexico. I haven't been there. South America would be awesome. USA, yeah, a lot of America. Oh, Namibia. Nice, nice one. I used to live in Namibia uh, for a few years. I love Namibia. Um, so we're also going to run a poll here just to get an understanding of the current current counting challenges you are having. Barbados, yes, I'd love to go there too. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to launch this poll. Feel free to read it and answer it. It's just to get an understanding of the challenges you may face uh, with accounting, and that will feed into the, the kind of the, the main webinar we're doing today. So I'll hit that off and feel free to answer that. So um for the next 30 minutes we're hannah is going to teach you everything that she knows about mastering year end uh, that should last yeah about 30 minutes and then i'll be handing over to evan who's going to show some practical you know because hannah's going to use a lot of slides and evan's going to show you some practical examples of the things that she spoke about in our application scribe but i promise you this is not a, a sales put pitch these kind of events are a bit of a hobby for us we do have our very specific training on scribe so if you are a scribe customer you would focus on you go to our uh, scribe only uh, training sessions but yeah evan will walk through that does that sound good to all of you just put a yes in the comments or not good 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 so we've got some yeses there so i'd like to introduce you to to hannah um she is our head of our head accountant she's been with us for over five years she's literally been with the company from the beginning so she's one of the longer serving members from basically when we had one customer or now web applications over to, to over 750 customers now. So she's been through the growth of the company. She's been training and supporting small and large councils across the England of Wales. She has had to deal with all kinds of queries, questions and everything. So she's basically heard everything. Um, she's also our product manager for our Scribe account. So she's a very, very busy lady, only works three days a week, but is super efficient. So it's good that we've got her today. So I'm gonna hand over over, well, I'll look at the result. Now, I'll let the, the, the poll continue to run and I'll hand over to you, Hannah. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Just share my screen. There we go. There we are, everyone. So, yes, as we said then, so today's session is on the secret to mastering the year end for town and parish councils four sections for today. First is thinking about preparing for the year end, the things we can be doing now to get ready, so 1st of March and beyond and having to prepare that agar. Then looking at the agar itself, the different elements within that, what to do once the agar is completed, what you do with regards to publishing it, etc. And then a little bit at the end, just thinking about the new financial year. So it's sort of bogged down in the current financial year at the moment, but also being aware of the new financial year rapidly approaching as well. Okay. So firstly then, preparing for the year end. So I think important to say that obviously quite a lot of work involved in completing the AGAR over and above the normal 
um, sort of monthly regimes that you'll be running. So firstly, it's important to expect that additional workload, be prepared for that, understand that there's going to be additional work to do. And if you can factor that into your schedule, so rather than sort of finding a little bit of time here and there, put some specific time aside that you're going to be able to dedicate to completing the agar. And also maybe in between now and the end of March as well, put a bit of time aside. Do I need to do some preparation for the end of the year? Do I need to get my cash book up to date? What can I do now to be in a better position once we get to the 1st of April and thinking about doing, doing all the year and stuff. So as I alluded to there, up-to-date and accurate data is key. If you come on any of our sessions, we're always talking about, please, please, please make sure your cash book's up-to-date, get your data on, get it on, make sure it's accurate. Complete your monthly bank reconciliations as well. So get them up to date. If you've got a pile of invoices in the corner that you haven't put on your cash book or you've got some statements and you haven't reconciled them, please, please do that and do that. Maybe put some time aside to do that between now and the end of March. If you've got a bank reconciliation error that won't, just won't go away, please also that you just can't get rid of, look for that now because if you haven't got a bank reconciliation balancing at that point then you won't be able to proceed with the rest of the year end okay and also then if you're possible thinking about your VAT return as well obviously if you're VAT registered it's likely that your quarter four will end on the 31st of March I know sometimes it straddles the year end which is quite annoying but if it does then obviously you're going to need to do your quarter four return anyway but if you just claim it back think about your form 126 can you be doing some work for that now thinking about the VAT entries on your cash book, have you got the appropriate paperwork, the VAT numbers, have you got the details of the VAT numbers, what could you be doing now in order to get ready for it? Obviously, you don't have to submit a VAT claim as at the 31st of March, but we would recommend that you do that because it just keeps things nice and neat in the line with the, with the year end. Okay. Sorry, so also think about the accounting approach you're going to need to take as well. So that was one of the questions that we've just had on the phone. It seems to catch quite a lot of people out. Often when we talk to people and say, what accounting approach do you use? They don't always know. They're not sure what they use. They might know what they're doing, but they don't know what it's called, or they know the, the approach they're meant to be using, but they don't really know what that means. So this is obviously really significant for the year end as well. So you've got two approaches, receipts and payments for income and expenditure. Receipts and payments is a fairly simple form of accounting in that you literally record what happens when it happens. So you make a payment, it goes in your cash book the day that you make that payment, you receive some money, you log on the cash book on that day that you receive that money. So it's fairly easy, simple approach. You're not thinking about the time at which it relates to, you're thinking about the time to which it actually took place. Okay. The difference there to income and expenditure is that is about the timing of it. When does it actually relate to? Now, most of the time, your cash book will be in a receipts and payments basis. So you'll work on receipts and payments basis throughout the year. And then if you need to or you want to, you'll convert to income and expenditure at the year end. OK, so that's thinking about what has actually happened that is relevant to this year and therefore I need to adjust for. Do I have invoices that I owe that relate to this year? Have I paid for things up ahead, et cetera? So we'll talk about that in a little more detail, but it's quite important to understand what approach you're going to use, particularly if you are moving approaches or maybe you've done a year end at one council and now you've moved to a different one who has a different approach of being clear on what it means. Which approach are we using? What one and what do I understand what that means? So if you're under 200,000, so the threshold is that you, you would work in receipts and payments for the year. If you're above 200,000, but that's for three consecutive years, you would need to work in income expenditure. So you may have a scenario where you've gone above the threshold for one or two years because you've got a large project and you've paid out a lot, you've had a large grant come in. But if that doesn't continue for the three consecutive years, you wouldn't necessarily need to move the income expenditure. Having said all that, you can opt into if you want to. And that's often the case where you have councils that have clerks or councillors who are quite financially minded. They may decide to use income and expenditure. So make sure you kind of understand that approach, particularly, as I said, if you've moved to a different council or maybe your council has needs to or has chosen to move between those approaches. If you have moved between approaches, do be aware that you will need to restate the prior year. So when we look at the AGAR in a little bit and the accounting statement section, you'll have the current year and the prior year. Both years need to use the same approach. If you've moved between from one to the other, you'll need to restate the previous year so that they're using the same approach. Okay, so do be aware of that as well. 
also thinking about your instructions from the auditor as well and what you need to do so again you may be in a scenario where your audit requirements are different if you may or you may if you might not have done a year end before this might be your first year end so again it's really important to understand what do i actually need to do what do i need to complete what the level of audit will be required so for example if you're a smaller council and you're under the 25k threshold you may be able to exempt yourself from audit so you need to be clear what does that mean actually you still need to do the agar you're just not going to send it off. So it's understanding what am I going to do? What process does it involve? What am I going to do with the agar once I've completed it? Also, it's really important to get yourself a copy of the DAPAG Practitioner's Guide if you don't have one already, because that supports the preparation of the agar. That's really important. It talks about all the relevant sections, how to complete them, things to consider. So do make sure you've got that sort of your Bible beside you as you're thinking about any of those sections, anything that you're not sure about is likely that the JPEG Practitioner's Guide will be able to help you with. And um, hopefully you can drop a link into the chat with that of anyone who wants it as well if they need it. And as I've mentioned there about restating, so you will need to restate if you've moved approaches, but also be thinking about, do I need to restate because of another reason? It might be that your auditor last year picked up a problem. If they've come back and said, this was an error, you need to restate these boxes. Obviously make sure you do that. Or you may be that you're a new clerk, a new council, and you found an error. We have a lot, that happens quite a lot. People come and join us at Scribe and they're a new clerk in role. And when we're trying to put the opening balances into the system, there's problems, things crop up that things maybe haven't done correctly, and there's requirements for re restatement. So be aware of those things. And if you do need to restate, obviously that's something that you can be doing now. You don't need to wait to the end of March for that because you can go and correct your figures from last year so that you're completely confident that your opening balance for this year is where you need to be. Okay, and we'll talk about all the boxes, etc., in a little while. Okay, then moving on to the actual agar itself now. This is what we're working towards. So the agar, for any of you who are new to this, maybe haven't done one before, that's the annual governance and accountability return, and it's for the year and periods the 1st of April to the 31st of March. Made up of three sections, the internal audit report, section one, the annual governance statement, and section two, the accounting statements, which is the numbers bit. So we'll have a little look at the first two sections briefly now, but we've got some really good sessions coming up on the internal audit separately in the next weeks, months. Um, so do look out for them because that goes into a lot more detail about the internal audit. And what I want to concentrate a little bit more on today is the numbers part of the accounting statements. Okay. So the internal audit report, then that's going to be the summarised conclusions from your internal audit coming in and reviewing everything. They're going to consider the adequacy and effectiveness of your council's procedures and your controls. So this is such as the way you've calculated the precept, the way you maintain the asset register, all those controls and procedures that you've got going on. So in many ways, this isn't going to be additional work because it's a review of things that you should have in place as they are procedures, controls, etc. Are they taking place? Obviously, there's going to be some work involved in you collating the information that the internal auditor requests, but it's it should be a, a review of the things that you are doing. Are you doing them efficiently, effectively, in, in line with your controls and your procedures? So carried out at least annually, but the scope and extent will depend on the council size and circumstance. So obviously you're bigger if you've got a bit more going on, if you've got quite a lot of different elements within the council, you may find it more relevant to have a more regular or more in-depth internal audit. But at the very least, it should be a report appropriate to give you the answers to these questions. So this is the thing taken directly from the AGAR that they will be reviewing in order to be able to give yes, no answers to these comments in here and that's what you're going to use as the basis to complete this so you'll need your internal audit report in order to complete this section of the ACAR. Okay. Linked quite heavily with that is section one which is the annual governance statement. Again this is a yes no tick box against certain statements and here to review the effectiveness of the system of the internal controls. So if we move on again you can see this is coming directly from the ACAR. Again it's certain statements about the procedures and things that you carry out are you able to say yes, hopefully, to these um, elements? If you do say yes, then you need to have the appropriate evidence supporting information that yes, you do that. You don't need to provide it to the auditor, but if there was ever a question or a review of that, that you've got those things in place that can prove that yes, these, these arrangements are happening. If you're not able to say yes, and if, you know, there's an issue, there's a weakness, there's a problem, you would have to give a no answer here, but you would then have to provide some additional information to the auditor to explain what the weaknesses were, what the issues were, how they're going to be addressed going forward to stop that 
from happening and moving from that. This is quite heavily interlinked, as I said, with the internal audit. Um, statements two and six are related to that. So six is particularly that you've had that internal audit to come in. So if you've arranged your internal audit, then you've instantly got a yes in box six because you've arranged that and that's happening. So again, it's a review of the things that you hopefully are doing anyway, and it's a yes, no answer at this point, just to confirm whether or not those things are in place. Okay. Moving on then to section two, the accounting statement. So that's the numbers bit. This is the bit more works involved because at this point you're going to need to collate the information in your cash book in order to fill all this in. Okay, so all the information that you've got in and that's why obviously it's so important to get all the data in, make sure it's accurate, get that bank reconciliation balancing so that you know at the point at which you come to complete this, that everything that you need in your cash book is in there and it's accurate. So in a moment, I want to talk about each of these boxes on this form and some things to be aware of. So this is taken from last year because at the moment there isn't the latest version, but obviously what we're going to be having is March 22 and then the prior, the current year of last year becomes um, your prior year. So thinking about that in there. Firstly, though, I want to go back to what we were talking about with regards to receipts and payments and income and expenditure. And just thinking about once obviously you know which approach you're going to be using what does that actually mean for when i'm going to be completing my accounting statements so as we said then receipts and payments is fairly simple because you're just recording what happens when it happens that means that for completing the accounting statements it's fairly straightforward because you're going to take your figures directly from the cash book you don't need to do any additional work once those figures are in they're collated they're totaled you're going to be taking directly from the cash book and putting them in. Obviously you're gonna to have to split them out over the relevant boxes, but it's fairly simple that the total of your cash book position is gonna be the totals that relate to the VAR itself. Income and expenditure, and as we said, a little bit more work to do because you're gonna to have to convert most likely to re from receipts and payments to income and expenditure. And that's what the JPEG practitioner's guide expect would happen that you'd work in a receipts and payments basis, and then you'll convert to income and expenditure. So there's some elements to consider when you're needing to do that. The first thing is that you'll exclude VAT from your totals. So whereas receipts and payments, you literally just take your total from the cash book, that includes VAT at the point at which it's happened and you put it in the, the boxes. Income expenditure, you need to exclude the VAT because at the year end point, it will constitute a debtor or a creditor. Did you owe some VAT to HMRC or some owed to you? And that's going to constitute a difference between your box seven and your box eight that we'll look at in a moment. You also need to add some adjustments in, and this is back to the timing that we were talking about. So this is where you're going to be considering what are the relevant things that, that have happened that we haven't taken account or haven't paid for. So have we had some invoices in, in dated in March or some work done in March, but we know we're not going to pay for that until April or beyond because of our process of agreeing payments and making payments is not going to happen. Therefore, we need to put them through as adjustments for our creditors, people that we owe, that we know we owe, we've had some work done. So in that scenario, we need to put some more cost into our figures because we should have paid for them and that relate to this current year. You may also have debtors. So if you sent invoices out, provided services to your customers, they haven't paid you, that would constitute a debtor. It's relevant to this year and you need to identify them. On the flip side of that, you may have paid for things up ahead. So you may have prepaid items. If you've paid for some building work already, but it's been delayed, it's not going to happen to the new financial year, you need to remove that cost from your accounts because it's not relevant to this year. It's not taken place in this current financial year. Or if you've had some money in from a customer, they've already paid you up ahead to hire out your hall, but they're not going to actually have that hire till the summertime for their party, whatever it may be, you would need to remove anything that you've received ahead of the way you haven't provided the service, because again, you're thinking about the timings, when does it actually relate to? So it may be a case of going through the invoices that you've had in and identifying what's happened, what have we not paid for, what is relevant to this year, thinking about invoices that you've raised that you haven't yet received payment for, and anything else that's relevant to moving around in terms of the timings and the relation to the, this current financial year itself. When you're doing that, there's a couple of things to consider as well. So I've put there about considering the materiality and the regularity. So firstly, the value of it. Are you going to have a cutoff limit? Are you going to say, well, we're not going to put any adjustments through for anything under 50, 100 pounds? Be consistent about that. If that's what you did last, you do the same. You don't want to necessarily be scrabbling about for the you know, pounds and pence of everything. Set a limit and be clear about that. 
Also consider the regularity. So if you pay somebody, your grounds maintenance people every single month, but you always pay them in arrears, you don't necessarily need to think about March needs adjusting for because I'm not going to pay it to April. If that was the same situation at the start of the year, and you've got 12 months worth of invoices in, it doesn't matter if the timings are slightly out in relationship to the actual months to they relate. The only point to consider there is if you did have, they did do some work over and above the March, maybe they always charge you a thousand pounds, but there was an additional fee because they cut down a tree, whatever it may be, you may want to put an adjustment in for that because that's outside their normal monthly amount that you charge that would be in your accounts as normal. So consider some of those things. You don't want to make loads of work for yourself, accruing everything that happens monthly, your phone bill, your broadband, because if it's a monthly but fee, you've already got 12 months worth in there. And also make sure last year's adjustments are reversed. Obviously, that's quite an important thing that they'll come out, be replaced with what's actually happened, plus any additional adjustments. If you've got software, then that will almost certainly do it for you. But if you're using Excel, make sure that you, you've adjusted for those last year's adjustments as well. So then we can think about the boxes themselves <coughs> and just some pointers when you're completing each of those boxes to think about. So box one is our balance brought forward. It sounds fairly straightforward, but obviously make sure it's equal to box seven of the previous year. Make sure that your starting position is your closing position for last year, particularly if you had a few different variations of your form for last year and then things got changed, or particularly if you've needed to restate. Very important, obviously, to make sure that box one is actually your box seven of last year. Box two then says precepts or rates or levies. So for councillors, it's just your precepts. So don't be caught out when he's mentioning rates or levies. That refers just to drainage boards. So you need to put still money in there or anything like that. And also be mindful if that you receive your precept from your district council with any other payments, council tax um, support, et cetera. Make sure you split that out so it's purely just the precept into box two. And then moving on to box three then, total other receipts. So that'll be everything else that you've received other than the precept making sure not to include any movements of money. So if you've had bank transfers and you've recorded them as ins and outs in different accounts, make sure they're not included in your total receipts because it's just movements of money within the council. It's not a true receipt. I've put there exclude that if working income expenditure. So be mindful of that for all the relevant boxes. Um, receipts and payments should just put the total in. And also be aware as well that if you have a credit note, refund, overpayment back from a supplier, it is not a receipt entry, it's, it's a correction of an overpayment, so it needs to be entered on your system or cash book as a negative payment entry. So make sure you haven't got any refunds, credit notes, et cetera, in your box three, because it's not a true receipt, it's just a correction of something that was overpaid previously. Moving on then, box four is your staff costs. So make sure you're clear on the guidance as to what to be included, because that changed a couple of years ago just to be your core staff costs, salary, pension and I, etc. not other things such as mileage, um, other allowances, etc. So they are not box four, but hopefully you're clear on that because that did change. But make sure they are the only things that are going into box four. Box five is your loan interest or capital repayments. So obviously that's fairly straightforward. Record it separately from other payments, any loan interest that you've made payable. And box six, all other payments, so that's everything else other than your staff costs and other than your loan interest. Um, again, on the flip side of that, don't include any bank transfers, movements of money, and make sure if you have had a refund from a supplier, it goes into other payments. And obviously the flip side of that, if you've had a customer who's paid you to hire out the hall and it's been cancelled and you've paid them the money back, it's not a payment, it's a negative receipt. So be clear about the difference about if you have to give money back to people, it's because you're refunding a receipt that they've already received from them. You're not, it's not a separate payment. So be mindful of that. Otherwise you run the risk of overstating your boxes three and six, your receipts and your payments. Okay. Moving on to box seven then. So that's gonna be your sum total of all the boxes that we've just talked about. So box is one, your opening balance is plus your income of precept and other receipts, mm -hmm. less your payments out of your boxes four, five and six, staff costs, loan repayments, other payments. Obviously make sure that it adds up, that you've got all that income in correctly and you, and you total it um, correctly. So box eight is your total value of cash and short-term investments. That's basically your bank reconciliation position. So that's why it's so obviously so important to have a starting point of a balancing bank rec at the start of the position, because then that means you know your cash book's correct and the figures that you take from your cash book to fill in these other boxes will therefore collate back to your box eight. 
If you are working in receipts and payments, it's a really nice check because box seven and box eight will be the same figure. Box eight will be your bank requisition and box seven will be the same figure because it's just a breakdown of how you got to that based on the boxes that we've just talked about. Okay. If you're working in income expenditure, boxes seven and eight will be different. Box eight will be your bank requisition, but box seven won't be the same because of these adjusting items that you've identified. Box seven is basically what my bank account would have been had all of these things happened. If I'd have paid those invoices that I owed, if I'd had that money in from those debtors, this is what it would have been. Okay, so be clear on, on the difference. If your receipts and payments, box seven and eight must be the same. If you're an income and expenditure, more, almost certainly boxes seven and eight will be different. It's, the possibility that they could be the same if you had absolutely no adjustment and they were back completely up to date, but it's unlikely. Okay. So then moving on then, box nine is your fixed assets and your long-term investments. So this is something else that you could think about doing now in terms of your asset register. So if you've had any additional assets this year, have disposed of anything, you could look to update your asset register and readiness for box nine. You need to make sure you're consistent in your reporting of the total. So most of the time you'll likely be using your purchase cost, the acquisition value to populate box nine. But if you have changed that and you've moved to the current value, for example, obviously make sure you're consistent with that approach. And if you've moved in this year itself, you'd need to restate to have the same approach in both years. Okay. Make sure your asset register got all the relevant information. So in the same way that you'll be checking your cash book is up to date and accurate, make sure your asset register is the same and ignore depreciation. We've had a few questions about people, particularly when they've come from a commercial um, accounts background and they recognise depreciation against fixed assets. That's not relevant here. It's purely just the cost of it. Because you to buy it in there and that's what it's in. And if you dispose of it, it's, it comes off the register it, and, the cost, and the cost goes into the payments when you buy it. And if you sell it for anything, it's simply a box three receipt. So be clear about that. There's no depreciation. Lastly then, box 10 is your borrowings, and that is the amount that you owe if you've got any loans, likely from um, Public Works Loan Board, and it just needs to be the updated figure to the amount that you owed as of the 31st of March. Okay, so again, just some work to update that, particularly obviously if you've made some repayments within the year itself. So that's all the boxes that we're going to go through then, then thinking about those things, and then other documents alongside that to consider your bank rec, as we talked about, really important. I'd always make sure your bank reconciliation balances first before you start the rest of it, because if it doesn't, you're gonna have a problem. As we said, it's gonna to agree to box eight. You're gonna have your reconciliation between box seven and eight if you're an income expenditure, as we mentioned. So that's gonna be the summary of the debtors and creditor entries that you've put in, including your VAT debtor or creditor to balance out what the difference is between box seven and box eight. So you need to be clear and list that as well. And you're also going to need to explain any variances. So you need to compare the current year, which is the year you're going to complete for 31st of March 22, to last year's figures, and any variances over 15% for your boxes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, and 10, you'd need to explain. So what is what's happened? Why are we above this variance? And also if box seven is more than twice box two. So box seven is your total funds position. Box two is your total preset. So in this scenario, it's basically saying that you're holding quite a significant amount of money as funds, more than twice your preset, which normally, <coughs> excuse me, you wouldn't do unless you have significant reserves. Obviously, if you've got reserves, that's absolutely fine. And you'll have a general reserve that will cover your running costs that's normally between three to 12 months equivalent, which is absolutely fine. Anything other than that will be your specifically earmarked for capital reserves that you can hold. There's no limit to the size of those reserves that you hold. Obviously, if you're going to build a community center, it's going to be pretty big. And then therefore you may well have your box seven is more than twice box two. And that's fine if you can explain that, just why that give all the reasons. But obviously if you just got a lot of money in the bank and you don't really know what's gonna happen with it, that's an issue and you need to address that. That's quite significant. Whatever variances or differences you need to explain, make sure you give full numerical explanations, details of everything. It's not just appropriate to say, I hired out the hall a bit more this year than I did last year because of COVID. You need to be quite specific, give numbers, give differences, breakdowns of the information. Otherwise you're gonna get the order to come back and wanting more from you. So be very, very clear about it. It may also be a good idea, something you could think about doing now. Make, if you know you spent some money somewhere or you've received a bit more, make some notes on those things. That when you come to this point and you identify those variances, you can look back at your notes and go, oh yeah, 
that's because we've made a large purchase or we've had this big grant or some starting point as to why those differences are. Okay, that takes us through the agar. Now we can think quick briefly about what do we do once we've got the agar, agar completed in terms of signing it off and publishing it, etc. So once those accounting statements are done, the RFA is going to sign them off and then you can have your meeting and you're going to receive and note and approve all these elements. So these different elements of the agar itself, the internal audit report, the annual governance statement, the accounting statements. If it turns out that you can um, exempt yourself from the audit, so you're under the £25,000 threshold, there are some other criteria, so do check them if you're not sure, and you can do that, you can approve that, and then you'll sign the rest of it off as relevant. Okay. Then that enables the RFO to set the commencement date for the exercise of public rights. So the accounting records that you've created must be available to view by any interested person. Anyone who wants to see them can do so. And electors can also raise questions or make objections to them, but you must have approved and published it before this inspection period starts. You need to have that meeting to do that process. And then you can set that, that must be a period of 30 working days. Okay, so anyone who wants to review that. And then you can think about what you need to send to the external auditor. So as we said, if you're exempt from audit, you'll just send them off the certificate of exemption. I've heard of a few <coughs> confusion where people say everything, but no, they just need the certificate itself. If you're not exempt, then you're just going to send all the relevant parts of it. So the agar itself and all the associated documents that we've just talked about, and the details of your exercise of public rights and any other information. So if there's anything else that you've done that you need to restate or you've had some issues with saying no to some of the any other information that you need to provide, you would send off to them. And then you can think about actually publishing your documents. So if you're exempt from audit, you can put it all on there. So that's your agar itself is the top bit, the associated documents, the arrangement for your rights and public rights, and then the details of your public of your external auditor. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're not exempt, you would publish these items here, but you'd also need to declare <coughs> that the accounts are as yet unaudited and give those details until the point at which you receive it back from the external auditor, and then you would be able to update with those additional bits of information. <coughs> One second, Hannah, I'm just going to go to the poll and you can have a drink of water while we're doing that, no worries. So we've been running this poll. Um, we're going to end it very shortly. We're asking what are your council principles? Well, <laughs> what are the counting principles that you find most challenging? So it's your last chance to do that. Um, while you're doing that, um, we will be sending out the presentation to all of you by email, a recording of this and any links we've shared. So let's just end that poll right now and I'll share the results with all of you. And as you can see there, uh, the biggest challenges people do face is around reserves. Um, a little, yeah, so that's similar to when we previously run, run the poll. And we've also never had geniuses. So we've got our first two geniuses in the, in the group. So I'll stop sharing that and then uh, we'll go back to you. Thank you, John. I think I hope I'm okay now. Yeah, so just to finish that last little bit off then that you'll have your, once you've got your audit back from external auditor, you'll then be able to publish those last bits, which is going to be the conclusion of audit back from them, basically signing off and including any amendments and then their certificate that they provided to you. Okay, so that will take place and you need to have done that by the end of September. Okay. And just to finish off then, as we said, the last little section that I wanted to talk about was just looking ahead to the new financial year. So obviously in the moment, we're all in sort of the midst of thinking about the current financial year. At the back, sort of just before Christmas, we were thinking about the budget for the new financial year. So we're kind of sort of all moving around, but think about next year. Now we're back in the, in the thick of thinking about the current financial year, but just some pointers to looking ahead for the new financial year. <coughs> obviously you can do some work now if you want to, in terms of setting up the cash book for the new financial year, because it may well be that you'll need to run that alongside the current financial year. Some people I talk to like to finish off the current year and then they'll start their cash book for the new year. But obviously if time goes on, you're a big accounts on that, that work simply won't be possible. So if you can do some work now to be ahead so your cash book's ready for you from the 1st of April, that's great. It may be a point at this point as well that you can think about that cash book, particularly as you're trying to collate the information at this point is there issues? Do there things you need to address? 
Is it fit for purpose? Have I had enough training on it? Does it suit the needs of my council? How could I improve it? It might be that it was brilliant 10 years ago, but it's never had any changes. Some Excel was set it up, but I don't know how to change it. I'm, you know, cells are locked up, what do I do with it? Is there things that you could be doing and thinking about and changing now? It might be considering a change of medium or the coding structure that you're using. So some things to think about with regards to the cash book in terms of how to structure it. <coughs> I suggest that you base it on your council budget or preset breakdown. Now, it sounds quite strange because it's surprising how many people's cash books that I've seen that bear no resemblance to their budget. So they have a nice budget sheet with all their budget lines in it, breakdown of the budget against it. And then I have a cash book that has none, none of that information in it. So then if you wanted to look at what have I actually spent against this budget line, it can't be collated easily. It's not an easy report they can produce and it's very hard to analyze that information. So think about the budget breakdown that you're using, use those codes, allocate your payments and receipts out to those budget codes. And also think about grouping codes together if you're gonna require reporting on them. So if someone's gonna to say to you, how much have we spent on the village hall? How much have we had in hiring? be able to provide that information do that's the sort of thing that you need to be able to provide and could it be improved upon so it might be that you need additional codes as we talked about so if you group everything into open spaces but actually you could really do with knowing what we spent on grass cutting hedges trees the play park whatever it may be split it out and analyze it further or is it too detailed have you got codes for every single thing and actually you get to the end of the year and some of them you barely use do they just want taking out the cash book make it look a little bit simpler um, less onerous to manage as well. And can you put more information into the cash book? If you do, should you be recording your invoice numbers and details? So say if you happen to keep referring to your paperwork that relates to the cash book, can you put more information in it? So that's sort of the hub of every bit of information that you need. So that's just some things to think about at this point, if you've got a little bit of time to get ahead so that next year, that when you're at this point collating the information for the year end, it's actually a bit, a bit easier and some things to think about at that point. Okay, that's everything I wanted to go through today. Thank you for that. Sorry about my little cup in the middle there. I yeah, will... You just you just survived. Your I've voice just, just survived. I just did it. So there we yeah, go. Yeah, well done, Thank Hannah. You Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks, Hannah. Um, so some of this may seem a well uh, overwhelming for a lot of you. We're here to help, and we'll be doing a question and answer session very shortly. And just to be clear, those questions, if you are a current Scribe customer and you've got specific questions about using Scribe, we won't be answering those today. You can go to hello at scribeaccounts.com and get your support. And we have separate events about that. Um, yeah, so we've seen a lot of slides there. So I'm going to hand over to Evan now. He's just going to show you some practical examples. He's going to be using Scribe to do that, but just to show how some of those kind of principles can play out if you are using uh, software. So over to you, Evan. Thank you, John. I'm going to share my screen with everyone so you can see Scribe. I've got it loaded up in the background here. Hopefully you can now see I'm, I'm signed into Scribe here. I've just gone onto uh, our website and clicked sign in. It's very straightforward to get into Scribe. What I'm going to show you is a couple of bits that are quite relevant to what we've just uh, obviously covered. So the year end process is obviously you know, the, the reason we're all here. It's really, really straightforward within Scribe. So really the, the kind of ethos of Scribe and, and the, the way that the system works is we know all of this stuff is really complicated, especially if you don't come from a financial background. If you're like me, all of that that, that Hannah just covered basically just crossed my eyes. I didn't really understand any of it. Scribe, the system does, and it can just do it all for you. So the year-end process, uh, if you're on receipts and payments, is as simple as just clicking annual return here within Scribe and then producing your section two of your agar. So you can see here, we've got boxes one through 10 all filled in already. Um, it's just produced instantly within Scribe. You can then share it straight over to your auditor. You can do your explanation of variances report as well within Scribe. You can see here, Scribe knows when you need to provide that explanation and you can just type, type that into, uh, into the boxes here. And then what you do is you produce your explanation report, which looks like this. Um, so it's very, very straightforward year end process if you're using Scribe. Obviously you, it is an accounting system. It's specifically designed for parish councils. So it's only as good as the data you put into it. You will need to add on your transactions throughout the year and then just reconcile your bank uh, each month. And from there, it's everything's automated. Now, uh, John obviously pointed out that in the uh, in the poll there, it seemed like everyone was uh, having a bit of problems with reserves. You can manage your reserve funds within Scribe. 
So the, the, the way that looks really is you can produce a reserve balance reports just at the click of a button, which shows you your reserve funds and, and how they're being managed. So what we do is we separate capital and earmarked reserves. We have various different funds here. You can see I've got playground and, and uh, the under car park resurface. We've got our opening balance for each fund, anything that's happened throughout the year with those pots of money, and then that current balance over on the right. I've just produced instantly. You can also produce your VAT return within Scribe. So this is the, uh, the VAT 126 form. That's how quickly you can produce it. So all of these things really are just to, to kind of take the stress out of accounting for, for councils. If you want to see any more, just throw a yes in the, uh, in the comments. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get in touch with you at another time and we can go over it in a little bit more detail. Um, before I go, though, I did think it would be relevant just to show everyone that we do have a free resource. It's completely free. It's called the, uh, the Council Clerks Mastermind Group on Facebook. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, essentially what this is, it's, a, it's a, just a group on Facebook for clerks and RFOs to share their experiences, ask questions, share information. Um, it doesn't have to be about the accounts. It can really be about anything to do with local authorities. And you'll find that you know, within our 1,300 members, you'll definitely get a response from someone who's been there, done that, and, and has all the answers for you. Uh, incidentally, we actually had a, quite an interesting question yesterday from Sasha here. She's asked, um, just for some opinions on Scribe as a, as a business, you know, the, the product that we provide, whether or not it's, it's going to be a, a good option. You can see here we had about 48 comments coming back. We were absolutely overwhelmed with the, the response. You can see we've had things like from Anne here saying that she'd highly recommend Scribe. Christina saying that uh, the system just saves her hours um, you know, producing reports. So if you want to have a look at Scribe, please do get in touch with us and uh, I'll be more than happy to show you a bit more. Uh, John, you're on mute. You've pulled a classic there. Major fail. We should never be doing that. We are webinar professionals. So I'll have to put some fine into the cookie jar for that one. Um, so, but yeah, as well as the Clark's um, Facebook group, we've also got a counsellor's one. So again, we don't get involved in this. We just administer it. It's there for everybody to use. Uh, another resource that might be useful to you is the uh, year-end checklist. I've just dropped some links there that you can go out, down and uh, download that. And then also this is an ex uh, offer that we're making to you guys. We've got five free slots available to you on this webinar to basically get set up with your agar and your do your year-end uh, for, for, for this financial year. So you're basically getting free professional services from the likes of Hannah, a qualified accountant that we have at the company to basically set you up, uh, do a one to one handover, set up uh, the structure, add your bank accounts, restate your previous years, import your data and get the data entry so that you're ready. So that is available to you guys. You can click on that link or you can say uh, just yes and we'll get back to you. So other than that, we're going to now go over to the question and answers. So we've been having a few questions i'm going to call uh, call them out and then if you're available you can ask it so siobhan's been asking a few questions um siobhan are you there you, you you're the floor is yours you can ask a question otherwise um, i'd very much like clarity about the receipts and in receipts and payments and the income and expenditure if i've got it the right way around we're just over the um cutoff point for twenty five thousand, <clears throat> and we're very small so we're too small, really, to take out a subscription uh, with the like subscribe, as much as I'd love it. Um, but can you just explain which one I should be using when I picked up the, um, uh, the post last year? So I've done one year end um, okay. on the cash book. We had things for both. OK, but you, you're, you're hovering around about the £25,000 a year threshold, are you, you said? We, we are we're, we get a preceptor of about 28. Okay, so the income and expenditure threshold is 200,000, so you're nowhere near that. So you're no. absolutely fine to be in receipts and payments, that's absolutely uh -huh. fine. Um, with regards to exempting yourself from the audit, you'd have to wait till you get to the year end. But if either your receipts or your payments total go as over 25,000 pounds, you wouldn't be able to exempt yourself. No, okay, so if your precept's just over that, then that wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. But yeah, but you're fine to be in receipts and payments if that's. Uh -huh. You did last year you can continue as you are yeah that's what i did thank you yeah have. Great. Did you have one? Um, sorry John. Yeah, John. 
Um, yes, so we've got Sally. I don't know if Sally's questions were specific to Scribe, but uh, over to you, uh, Sally, are you there? Um, if it is very specific to details on Scribe, then we'll we'll support you on a different channel. But yeah, Sally. No, it's 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 not for Scribe. In, I oh, don't good. use Scribe. Good, good. Yeah, far away. Um, yeah, the, um, oh, I asked several questions and now I forgot. <laughs> well, you've got a few. So you had, how do I show in receipts and payments that we have transferred money to a specific reserve? but it has stayed in the same bank account. Yeah. That's one. <laughs> okay, so that actually won't have any relevance to the or end of your actual accounting statements because that will still be in your pot of money. And when you report it, it'll just be a total. Obviously, it'd be a good idea to keep your separate records of all your reserves and your breakdown, but you don't need to have any details. And if you're just moving money around, it that's that's kind of irrelevant. You're totally producing the box seven and eight as your total position. You may want to have that and obviously like i said if it's if it's a significant amount that's above twice box two you need to explain it as a separate issue as a separate explanation but in terms of the actual agar you're just going to be reporting totals your actual total fund that you've got so it goes in the budget but not in the other account yeah, for the actual end of the year you're just thinking about the totals but obviously in terms of the budget separately to that you can manage it and see what you've got in the pot to spend on things but actually in terms of that you're just going to be reporting it as a total for the agar itself Thank you. Okay, no problem. Well, did you have any others ones uh, you want? The, uh, the RMP item hasn't come through on the statement by 31st of March. We should not include it in this year's accounts. So that's actually a good thing to, to, to think about in terms of un, um, presented items versus creditors and debtors. So I think it's worth actually just for everybody. So if you have an unpresented item, that's where if you've sent out a check, for payment somebody or somebody paying it hasn't gone into the bank account so it's not appearing on the statement that's an unpresented item and that's absolutely fine to be included because if you've recorded on your cash book because you've sent that payment out if your um, supplier hasn't cashed that check that's irrelevant it's an unpresented item that you would include in your bank record and it would make up the total of box eight so it, box eight will be your bank statement plus or minus any unpresented items but that is different to creditors and debtors where you haven't paid for it so if you should have if it related to march but you're not paying to april you put an adjustment in if you're income expenditure but if your receipts and payments you ignore that it's only accounting for the items that you've actually sent a payment off for so this will be more relevant for those of you still using checks if it's obviously instant online banking you're not going to have so many issues of unpresented item but if you still use checks be aware of be aware of that sort of difference and be aware of unpresented items where you've sent checks off that haven't appeared on your bank statement. Good. Thank you. Kate Dyer, are you there? Feel free to ask your question. You're on mute. You've, you need to put a penalty in the cookie jar as well. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I wasn't intended to. I only asked earlier on just a habit. Um, what? Bear with me. I was the asking. About, oh, yes. That was quite a while ago, yeah. Um, I think it was it was just the adjustments that I had concerns about. I hear the term accruals in my paperwork that I get through for, and I don't actually, every year, I have to think about and try and reteach myself what it actually is. So okay. I was hoping you can give me a summary I could write. Yeah, sure, remember. absolutely. So most of the time it's accredited. There's a slight difference between a creditor and accrual. A creditor is somebody that you haven't, you know you owe them, you've had an invoice for them, but you're not gonna be able to pay it to the new financial year. And accrual is where you know you're going to, but you don't know exactly to say how much. You might have had some work done, but you haven't yet received the invoice, but you know you've had some goods or services provided to you. So you're going to put an amount in, say, someone's come and done some work. I think I'm going to need to pay them £500. That's my accrual. Someone else has done some work. They've invoiced me for £1,000. That's a creditor because I've got that invoice and I know I need to pay it. Okay, so that's a slight difference. And then on the flip side of that, a debtor is somebody that owes you. So that adjustment for the accrual was done in the following financial year when so you then get to so what you would do. So when you get to the end of this year, if you know there's some things you've not paid for, you'd add it into your current situation. So your book six, your other payments, you say, this is what I've actually paid, plus my credited and, and then my accruals for the things I know I need to pay. And that's my total box six. When you get into the next financial year, you deduct them out, you'd reverse them because then you'd actually pay it. And then at the end of the next year, you'd put in any new adjustments for the end of end of the following year, mm -hmm. and then you just continue on like that forever. 
thank you very much okay. I, always, I always thought like you say that they were the same as but now that makes sense yeah that it's like, it's like the, the principles the same what you do with them the same but that's just like the slight difference there ah uh, thank you no worries i also asked just very quickly if you could recall the dates of the exercise of public rights because i can't remember what they are they moved them didn't they 30 working days but it has to include is it Oh, anyone here would like to I couldn't remember the day no and this is like slightly outside because I need Jo who's our um self-qualified cut but I don't think she's on here today but I can uh, get... Jo's on holiday yeah so she Jo would be perfect for that but I don't think she's no worries I'll look at I was just cheating that's so no, that's... <laughs> I'll ask it I'll ask it on the team chat uh right now and Absolutely. then maybe we'll get yeah, an answer we'll thank you thank you for your help no problem cool um Mr Lewis are you there did you get your question answered, Michael Lewis? I think it was, okay, he's not there. It's, it's, I guess it was a, he saw the agar form come up and said, where do we get the agar from? And it's kind of, well, the answer is you have to produce it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you'll have the form it's from the auditor. So I got that for the PKF Little John website. The current one isn't on there yet, but they should all send that communication to you directly to have that information. But you can go and have a look on your auditor website now. Um, and say and see that information but at the moment when I last looked on PKF they hadn't got the updated one for this year it's still last year's but this last year's okay cool year. we'll, we'll provide a link to that um, we're open now that's all the questions that are in the chat any other live questions feel free to drop in otherwise oh we've got an answer there must be a 30 working day period called the period for the exercise of public rights during which you can exercise your statutory right to inspect the accounting records. So we've got hands up from Simona. I, just a silly one. It's the first year that I'm doing an AGAR, so I'm not sure of the basic. Um, do I need to have a kind of appointment letter with both the internal auditor and the external auditor? Or how does it work? Do I need to present the quote to the council and they need to approve vote? Or the external auditor is a kind of already appointed? Uh... Yes, you'll have your external auditor. You, yeah, you, you can appoint, so you'd need to go out and find your internal auditor and that's fine to find okay. somebody. But the external auditor, you will have it depending on where you are in the country, the likely PKF, maybe somebody yes. else. Yeah, PKF, yeah. So then they will just, yeah, you will have to have. They and do I need to inform them that? Am I going to submit something? They, they should expect uh, the they document, just, they'll or they know it. Them. They'll, they'll. Everyone needs to send them something. Either it's, it's their certificate of exemption, or you're just going to send the whole lot, lot to them. So they'll just have that from you. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Donna. Yeah, is there um, a step to step, step by step guide on Scribe or somewhere about actually running the year end and what, what you do first and then, you know, actually closing down the financial year? I've only been the clock since the 4th of January, so oh, I've been in finance yeah. before. Absolutely. So there are there's some, there's some checklist there's some checklists and some guidance on there so that you can read. Or we're also running some sessions a bit like this, but just for Scribe customers that you can sign up for, and we go through the whole process. It'll likely be with me, and you can go through the whole process. So if you go on the Scribe Academy, which is where you likely signed up for this, there's all the dates of when they are. It's there's two. There's one called preparing for year end, which is all the things that you can do to make sure your Scribe account is ready, and then yeah. there's one called completing your end I think it is on Scribe and that's how to do it itself okay I, I think I'm on some but I'm not sure that I've got okay. completing so, the year end so okay yeah. if we go yeah, let's go down thank you oh yeah cool all right any other oh, questions yeah. um oh yeah there we go there's while well, you go there go to Scribe Academy also if there's no more questions, uh, we're doing a few more of these. Well, we're doing these events every month now. So we're doing education events that are based on theory and practice. Doesn't matter what system you're using, whether you're using paper, uh, Realtor, Sage, Scribe, you're welcome along. I highly recommend. So I've got I did a blog post on it. So we've done we've done February now. Oh, well, we're in February. So we got uh, <laughs> Julie um, coming along doing top 10 uh, compliance with cemetery. And then related to this, I highly recommend you come along to the happy year ending with Eleanor, the auditor. Um, so she is an auditor. So it's kind of one last sanity check of the kind of any issues that you might uh, have 
yeah so highly recommend i'll send these links through or shelly will send follow up she'll get an email from her later but yeah if there's no more questions have a really good day um yeah